We are in uh, Hebrews 11, but we've detoured from Hebrews 11 to Genesis, looking at the life of Abraham, and we're in chapter 14 and 15. We kind of left off with this last week with a series of maps as far as the invasion from the east coming into the Rift Valley. Uh, we'll go through those again. It's going to involve Abraham going up to rescue Lot and kind of get a picture of Abraham uh, and the influence he had in the area and the power he had within his own company, his own camp, which was uh, fairly large considering all that was going on. Uh, but first, let's just for the sake of staying true to our subject, our series, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and read a few verses there. And I know we've read them before. Uh, but we're going through those who live by faith, those who continue to endure life, to face life uh, with an understanding of what God was doing. Uh, the big picture of, of God is going from point A to point Z, the Alpha to the Omega. He's in the process of eliminating evil. People may ask, you know, how can you believe in God when there's evil in the world? Well, that is what history is. History is a matter of eliminating evil. God is going to conquer evil. He's already demonstrated that with the resurrection from the dead through G by Jesus Christ, which puts us all, the believers, in a place of the resurrection. We will live again in the kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, it will be the kingdom ruled by Jesus Christ, and there will be no evil be again called the home of righteousness. So we are in a process now. Uh, as humans, we may want to just snap our fingers and, you know, like a genie, get away with or get, get rid of all the problems and all the evil. But God is answering all the questions, resolving all the conflicts as we go through history. We're called to live by faith, understanding that this is taking place, and endure the things that we are enduring, knowing that God is good and that He is leading us to a place of victory. That is the, the whole basic message of, of, of the Scriptures, that through the seed of the woman, God is going to conquer Satan. Jesus was the seed of the woman. He has conquered and began the victory procession, and we're living in that procession right now with an ultimate fulfillment. So all these people mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 were commended uh, by God for having lived by faith. And here's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. We got several verses mentioning Abraham. It says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance. Now, Tony mentioned this last week when we got done, uh, you know, about the name of Abram and Abraham. The one who left Ur of the Chaldeans, his name was Abram. And then during his lifetime, his journeys through Canaan, God is going <laughs> to call him Abraham, the father of many nations. And so the writer of Hebrews is not making a mistake. He's just calling him Abraham by his name that it was changed to. Uh, and so as we read through the book of Genesis, early in the accounts, it's going to be Abram, Abram, Abram. Then there's going to be a turning point where his name becomes Abraham, and it will continue like that. So there's, there's no real air in here. And even as I'm speaking, we should understand that, you know, at, up to a certain point, it's Abram. But I may be saying Abraham. We're talking about the same person. It's just a matter of what point in time his name was changed by God. And the scriptures will make that clear. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. <clears throat> By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with the promise, uh, heirs with him of the same promise. The Abrahamic covenant is going to be given to Abraham, and he'd hand it down to Isaac, not Ishmael. And then from Isaac, it'd be given to Jacob and not Esau. It continues saying, uh, again, notice he, he's, he's living in tents, and that is not the idea that he's just, you know, wandering around with no place to go, but he's living in tents, and these tents include an entire camp. There's going to be many people involved with his, who's, who's with him. It's not just him and Sarah that are traveling. And again, notice he's trusting God. He's going to a place he, he did not fully understand. And it's no different than us. We're called by God to go somewhere or live in a certain way. And we do that not knowing the, the for sure results. So Abraham knew this much, but he's trusting God for the big picture. We also know a certain amount, but we're, we're trusting God for the bigger picture. And so again, Abraham is a, a perfect example. And it, again, he's used by uh, James. He's used by the writer of Hebrews. He's used by Paul, used by Jesus, even throughout the Old Testament is used as an example. Uh, it says, uh, for he was looking forward to a city or to the city with foundation whose architect and builder is God. He was looking forward. He knew he wasn't going to find it in this age. 
He was looking forward to a city whose architect and builder is God, meaning it's eternal. You're not going to find it in the temporal world, which again provides a, a lesson for us. We're looking for what God wants us to do now. We're trying to do what is right, trying to make it prosperous, make it successful. We're trying to make things grow and be productive, but we're never going to find the ultimate. We're never going, it's, not, it's not here. So whatever we do here, it's passing away, and we're looking forward to the city whose architect and builder is God. So was Abram. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father, a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. That's going to come up as we go through these chapters of Genesis, the issue that he doesn't have a son. God's going to give him promises, and Abraham's going to realize these promises are going to just pass away as soon as I die and be given to uh, one of my servants because I don't have any children. And when we get back to Hebrews, we're going to have to break that verse 11 down. There's some uh, interesting things taking place in it that, you know, we have different manuscripts being handed down, and we'll take a look at that. Verse 13, all these people, mentioned them so far, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted they were aliens and strangers on earth. Again, that's what we are. This is not our home. We're here to occupy. We're here to be productive. We're here to do the will of God. But this is not what God has planned for. He has something greater planned for us. And they admitted they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. For example, when he gets to uh, uh, Canaan, there's a famine. And if he was just going to bail out and say, well, this isn't working, he could have backtracked right up to Haran, gone back to Ur. But instead, he goes to Egypt because he could not backtrack. He had to go somewhere else during the famine, which is maybe answers that question, why did he go to Egypt? Well, he, he couldn't go back home because he'd left home. He'd gone into God's plan. And now the only way forward, only way would be forward. Uh, they couldn't go back. They were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. There it says again, it's a heavenly one, meaning it's not of this age. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is similar to what Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. There's a place prepared for us in eternity. Now, again, we can talk about what if, you know, where that's at, what that's like, if it's a thousand years on earth and then eternal state, or if the eternal state is beginning with the thousand. We can talk eschatologically. But the point there is there is a place prepared. There, God is expecting us. God is preparing us. Our life is not going to end. We show up somewhere. It's like, okay, now where do we put you? It's like there's, there's another whole dimension to our life uh, somewhere else that God is, going to ha is preparing us for. Um, again, he says, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Uh, last part here. By faith, Abram, when God tested him, this is going to be the great test coming up later on in a few chapters, after he received his son Isaac, God tested him, which is, again, a tough verse to explain. It's easy in Sunday school. It's easy in mentioning as passing by. But if you actually sit down and think about what this test was, it's like, and you wrap your mind around what, it's like, oh, that, does that, that doesn't even make sense. But we will handle it as we go through there. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. And you can see oh, there's all kinds of conflicts there already. It's like, whoa, what, what, that doesn't even make sense. And yet it does. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And again, that, that son, Isaac, was the one who was going to receive the promise. I, Abraham didn't have a bunch of sons. He had Isaac. And Isaac was going to, already said, was going to be the heir of the promises. And he then was going to be sacrificed. So Abraham had to figure out how he was going to follow through with this and he's just going to simply without understanding how god was going to do it he's going to trust god and again like we do many times we're going to have to trust god not knowing how he's going to do it we know god is absolute god is permanent god is solid he's not changing but i'm not sure how he's going to fix this problem or resolve this conflict or this you know, negative situation, whatever it could be in life, if it be a disease, if it be a conflict, if it be a mistake you've made, it's like, well, this isn't good. It's like, but God is good. God is going, and, and you stay with God, He's going to work with this. And you can't understand it. In fact, you have a tendency to give up if you're looking at yourself. If you're looking at, how can I fix this? Why did I do that? And you begin to blame yourself and take your eyes off God in the temporal things. 
there's a place of being responsible, obviously, in the temporal world, but also when you get in a situation where it's like, this can't work, it's like, well, you keep your eye, that's faith, you, you keep your eye on God, knowing God is going to navigate through this, and you may not see it in this age, but you will see God work things out, that is, that is the promise. By faith, Abram, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice, he was, who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it's through Isaac the promise that I gave you is going to be fulfilled. Abr he was going to sacrifice him. Abraham reasoned. He figured, he planned in his mind, he did the math. Didn't know how it was going to happen, but he reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. He didn't really die, but he was right there in Abraham's mind. He was going to follow through thinking, well, God's going to have to raise this kid back to life because the promises are hanging on him. Then it goes through me. It mentions Isaac and Jacob and Joseph all in a verse in passing. We are in Genesis 14 going through the life of Abraham. So we're going to go back to Genesis 14 and pick up there. Uh, it wouldn't be bad to just go to chapter 11. This is why we never get anywhere. <laughs> chapter 11, a beginning in chapter 11, verse 10, this is the account of Shem, or this is the written document of Shem, the Toledote. And so he goes all the way through there, begins listing the genealogy coming from Shem. That mean, that this is the account, that means this is the written document. It comes from a word that means scraped, like scraping bark off a tree, which they would then write on the bark, uh, some kind of a written document that Moses somehow had access to, and he's editing through this. And it goes all the way through. It goes to verse 26. After Terah had lived seven years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And that's Abraham is born. Then his name is Abram. Then verse 27, we switch documents. It says this is the account of Terah. This is now the Toledot, the written account, the written document of Terah, Abraham's father. And then it begins to talk about him, and it leads right into the life of Abraham. And so all of these chapters come under the document, the life of Terah, or the written account of Terah. In if, we, if he had a stack of documents with Moses in the wilderness as he's editing the book of Genesis, if we consider that to what, what he was doing. Chapter 12 begins, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I'm going to show you. So he's called to leave Ur. They go up into Haran, then come down into the land of Canaan. And the promise in chapter 12, verse 2, I'll make you a great nation. Your name will be great. You'll be a blessing. All the peoples, all the nations will be blessed through you. Now, how? how, what, how I mean, there's no details. I'm just going to bless all the nations. I'm going to make a nation out of you, and all the other nations are going to be blessed because I've blessed you. It's like now, as Christians living in 2022, we can go, oh, okay, and we can begin making a list and anticipating some of the revelation that's been revealed. But Abraham is you know, somewhat limited, although I would not call him scripturally illiterate, but he is unaware of some of the actual historical events that are going to take place. Then it, then it goes through chapter 12. He has the, goes down, walks through the land, stops at Bethel, builds an altar. There's a famine. He goes to Egypt, prospers in Egypt, comes back into the land in verse 13, or chapter 13. And that's where you, you've already got a, a picture that Abram's got an entourage of people and servants and, and cattle and, and sheep. Uh, herds traveling with him uh now abraham and lot have to separate because lots you know like we said before it's like having a costco and a walmart side by side trying to use the same parking lot it's like we're, we're getting in fights our, our customers are fighting in the parking lot our employees are fighting us let's let one of us go somewhere you either go on that side of the town and i'll stay here or i'll go on that side of the town and you stay here and they had to decide where they're going to go because they're not fighting, but their employees are fighting, or their people are fighting. And so Lot chooses to go to the other side of the Jordan. And here's Galilee, Dead Sea, Jordan River. They're standing right here at Bethel, and they're looking over here at the Kakar, which means the, the, the circle. It's the Kakar. It's the plain is what it says in Genesis. And Lot decides to go over here this direction to the east anytime you move to the east in the bible it's sometimes like a, a warning sign you know they they left edom and eden and went to the east they went to captivity they went to babylon to the east they call it north went to the east lot moves to the east and he's going to be living he's got herds and this is something you got to watch this it doesn't make it clear but he's got herds he's got flocks it's, there's not enough room for all the cattle to eat and so he's moving over here to the plain but in this plain is going to be a city of sodom Gomorrah and the other cities are right over here in this plain. They're excavating them today. Uh, 
and then Abraham then stays over here in this land. So Lot moves this way. And that's uh, chapter 13. Uh, and then God says to him in verse 14 of chapter 13, after Lot left, well, I'll just read verse 12 of chapter 13. Abram lived in the land of Canaan. That would be over here, the land of Canaan. While Lot pitched, Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. So the cities of the plain, the plain is that word kakar, which means this disc, this flat area. This is mountainous uh, going this way, goes across pl pl a plain, then mountainous this area. This is the Rift Valley, and right here, all the water from the mountains runs down, and this is a very fertile place to live. It's, it's going to be called like the Garden of God, like the rivers of Egypt. So it's a great place to take your cattle. In other words, Lot takes the best part of the city to build his Walmart or Costco's or whatever. Um, and then God says to him, lift up your eyes, Abram, in verse 14, from where you are and look to the north, look to the south, look to the east and to the west. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. Now that's the promise that he's not going to receive. It's a promise that's going to be a promise he's going to take to the end of his life, but it's going to be there. It's, the part, it's, it's part of the, uh, the Abrahamic covenant. It's part of the Palestinian covenant. So he's standing here on, on, in the hill country of Benjamin uh, looking, and he, wherever he can see, that that's going to be his land. Now, it is already occupied by nations. We're going to see nations that are living here, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and they're all little tribal nations uh, one group right here living in Salem is uh, the Jebusites, ruled by Melchizedek, and it's a city-state right about here. And Abram is going to have a covenant with uh, Melchizedek, and he's going to use the land and also provide protection for his country. Lot apparently goes across here and gets pulled into some kind of agreement with the king of Sodom because he sees all this influx of prosperity come into his land. Now, again, I'm speculating at this point because Lot is going to end up in the city. And Lot is going to end up in some kind of partnership with Sodom. And so he comes in land, and we know the king here, Bera, the king Bera, in fact, they're excavating his palace. They found some of the walls of his palace in that location in Tel Hamam right now in Jordan. Uh, and so it's interesting what they're going to find there. The king is Bera. He would have wanted the same agreement with Lot that Melchizedek has with <coughs> Abram. Nonetheless, that's where Lot is living. And then we go to chapter 14. At that time, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of El Eleazar, Ketelamer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, went to war against, here's, that's four kings. Those four kings are out here to the east, over here in the eastern. Now we're still looking for those, and I say we as if I'm putting myself like I'm over there actively looking. I put that in those who are positive towards these verses that are looking for historical re references. I would be one of those waiting for something to pop up on my Facebook feed to say, oh, they found someone's name. So I'd like to be over there digging through the dirt, but that's obviously not going to happen. But there's four kings coming from the east, and they're coming this way, and they're coming against five kings, and here's those five kings. Bera, king of Sodom, Ber Ber Bersha, king of Gomor, Sinab, king of Adma, Sem Semibur, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. So those are your five cities, with Sodom being the main city and the other cities being like little satellite sister cities, suburbs if you would, but not definitely <laughs> suburbs, but they all kind of work together. <laughs> they would have somehow, instead of just being a city-state like uh, Jabesh or where does Salem, which is going to become Jerusalem, was at this time ruled by Melchizedek, they had kind of made a little treaty. And these four kings, as you can see right here, they had at some point expanded their authority. And as we mentioned before, there's a highway coming right down here called the King's Highway that connects the north to the south. It's connected to the land of, of, of Canaan across the Jordan right here. It expands out into the uh, 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 Jezreel Valley, Valley of Armageddon or Armageddon, but it's the Jezreel Valley. It's where uh, it was flat. They could travel very quickly over here. Here's the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and there would be a coastal highway going down here into Egypt. 
So you could connect with this, the King's Highway by crossing the Jordan, passing through the Jezreel Valley, and hooking up with the coastal plain going south or north right here. Uh, you could also come in from the north or even come down in through Galilee and come into there. Uh, then down south there'd be, which eventually going to become the spice routes, coming over and connecting to the King's Highway, cutting across here. And so this was, I mean, that's the, the interstate system. So these kings had somehow, these four kings had somehow began to tax, ask for tribute, demand tribute, had the authority to ask for tribute uh, from these five cities, probably all the way through this area, probably taxing caravans, bringing goods back and forth from the north, from Egypt, over into the Hittite territory, and what is going to be the Ugaritic right up in here. Uh, and so that's what you kind of see what's taking place right here. None of this is illogical. None of this is like mythology. All these later kings joined forces in the Valley of Siddam, the Salt Sea. Now, as we get onto these maps, I'm going to show you. Down here is the Valley of Siddam, the Salt Sea, down here. Now, what's going to, this is where, this is, no, this was, it's been years of trying to locate where Sodom was. And Sodom on your Bible maps, in your Bibles that you've got, is probably put down here, somewhere down here, and it's got a question mark by it. Uh, that's about to change in the next 10, 20 years when this becomes absolutely verified. That's going to be put up there with an exclamation point, and this is going to be ancient 1800s information because that they didn't know, but they're, they're finding that right now. Um, so this down here, this is the, where the battle is going to take place, down here. Now the cities are up here, but this battle, they're going to join in battle, and we're going to read through this and see how this happens. All these later kings, the five kings from Sodom, joined forces in the Valley of Siddam, the Salt Sea. For 12 years, they, these five kings of Sodom, had been subject to Ketelamer. He seems to be the head of the four kings from the east. Ketelamer, but in the 13th year, they rebelled. So for 12 years, they've been paying money, letting them their, their, their caravans be taxed, all the goods sold in their cities, however it's working out. They've got a certain amount of tribute they have to send up to these four kings in the east. They did it for 12 years. But in the 13th year, they decide, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep the money ourselves. If you want it, come get it. Okay, and so here they come. They're coming down to get it. Now, what you're going to see is a, the, an invasion coming down this king's highway, and they can't just bring their troops and march just right down the king's highway. They're going to have to conquer as they go, and they're going to do a sweep. Apparently, they're going to sweep right past Sodom, pass by on the king's highway, leaving these five cities just sit there, come down here and come up over in here and just kind of, we'll go all the way down to the Gulf of Quaba, come back up and just kind of clean up, and then that's when this group of kings is going to come down here and meet them on their return, and there's going to be the battle down here. Now watch as this takes place. Well, let's look. Let's look at the maps on page one of your map, of the notes. Uh, that very first map, it's Ketelamer's defeat of the Valley of S Siddam's neighbors. I think it's supposed to be S Sodom's neighbors. I, I, I don't know why he did that. Uh, but you can see the little squiggly line. That's the attack by the four kings from the east. They're going to go through Bashan, which is this area up here. Bashan is a very nice, fertile country. Uh, there's a city there called Asheroth, uh, Carnium. It's the home of the Raphaites. Now, the Raphaites throughout history, if it's in Deuteronomy, now you, you, you don't have to go here if you don't want to. If you want to stay in the 2022, say, that sounds ridiculous. I'm sure that's just the name of some people that were pretty tall and lanky, probably made good basketball teams, you know, whatever. But if you go to the Ugaritic text, if you go to the Mesopotamian text, you go to the Qumran scrolls, you go to Deuteronomy, uh, Raphaites were a descendants of the giants. There was an angelic rebellion sometime in Genesis chapter 6. They produced the offsprings uh, that became the Nephilim, the giants, the part human, part angelic, part spiritual, and they began to terrorize before the time of Noah. Thus God is going to wipe them out. It says they're on the earth before and after the flood. Now again, how that happens I'm not sure, but the Bible says, well, the flood destroyed them, but they showed up afterwards. Now, these Raphaites were a group that claimed descent from there. Now, if that is actual descent or if that is just mythological descent, 
they're claiming, and the Bible is recording, that they, were, they had some angelic blood in them, or their king, at least, had this angelic blood that they were superhuman of some level. That's, and that, that's your Ugarit, Ugaritic text, Mesopotamian, Sumer. Uh, down in the, the south of Mes- I don't want, Sumerians. It sounds like I'm saying Sumerians over here. But the s- uh, land of Summer, e- e- Egypt, they, Greece, their kings would always claim descent from the gods. And the gods, if it be Greek mythology, always produced with women some offspring of their own on the earth. And this, is, this explains a bunch of verses in the New Testament. Uh, we'll go on. and we'll, We're, we're going to do some more study on that later. But nonetheless, that is where the Raphaites live. They're going to continue down through Gilead. There the Zuzite giants are going to live. And Deuteronomy 2, 20 and 21 identify them as the large giants. You know, are they very, very tall? Or are they some kind of super creature that, and is it maybe just their, the line of kings? And even if it's not true, in Mesopotamian literature, their kings are claiming, even their names claim to be descents of these Nephilim. The Ugaritic text in the, in the cuneiform writing. It, it may be true, it may not be true, but they are claiming that they've got authority because, hey, my great-great-great-grandfather was one of the Nephilim that, whose father was one of the angels who rebelled that's locked up in Tartarus in the New Testament, or it'd be the titans of Greek mythology locked up in the underworld because they rebelled against God. They left the, their place of authority, as Peter and Jude record, and did this thing, and they've been locked up waiting for the day of judgment. But their descendants, their sons, the Nephilim, would continue to produce, and there'd be some connection back to that. That would be those different groups right here. And then they co- they're going to pass through that the Kirkar, the plain, that's that circle right there. That's a, the location of those cities. Um, now, Sodom is being excavated. Those other cities are just suggestions because they're, they're tells, they're mounds that would be within reasonable distance of Sodom at, that's being excavated right now. And then they go down through Shava, Curiathium, and that's where the Emite giants live, and that's Deuteronomy 2.10. They go all the way down to the hill country of Seir, where the Horites, that's another group of the giants, live. I've got on that first map the, uh, some ideas of where Sodom and Gomorrah, one suggestion of where those used to be, which I think that's obsolete, that it's probably up there in the circle. Now, again, that's my opinion based on the last 10 years of e- archaeology. The Nix map shows you how they've come down, go through the hill country of Sheer, these four kings. They go all the way down to a, a gulf of Aquaba called El Perrin, turn and come up to Kadesh, which is where the... You know, when uh, uh, Moses camps with, they camp at Kadesh Barnea. They come up there and attack that. They go through the land of the Amalekites, go all the way up to Haz Azan Tamar, which is right where the Amorites are living, kind of where Masada is today, right near the Dead Sea. Uh, and then they turn to come back to the King's Highway, probably to come up and finish off Sodom and Gomorrah, which they passed. Or just go right on back. But they're coming to get Sodom. Where they're kind of eliminating all the territory around them. So they can isolate Sodom. It would, it would seem. At that point, if you turn the page. When they turn the corner to come around the bottom of the Dead Sea. They come back. In other words, the, the four kings have come down. Conquering along the King's Highway. They've gone all the way down through the hill country of Edom. All the way down to the Gulf of Aquaba. Came back up. Cleaned up the land through the, the wilderness. The, the, the Negev gone up to this area just east of uh, west of the dead sea and then turn and come back around this way by that time Sodom and gomorrah are either located here which they're not they come down and engage in battle right here because remember when lot leaves he's standing on bethel and they look over and he looks to the east at the kirkar this is not the kirkar that's that's the bottom of the dead sea you can't see it from here there's no land down there you're going to find out even today it's tar pits So he's not going to take his cattle down here. This is not a ruin because of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a ruin because it's the bottom of the earth. It's where all the water drains into the lowest place of the earth, evaporates. It's tar pits, even in this chapter. So, again, you can argue that case, uh, but you're going to have to disprove some of these other things. And I'm not not making this a a, a doctrinal statement. I'm just saying, ah, I used to try to teach this and always be like, hmm, hmm. They're looking here, but they're going here. That'll make sense. And then all of a sudden, uh, an archaeologist, uh, Dr. Collins, he, he said he had the same trouble. So he just went here and looked. 
And over there you could see Tel Hamam. He got permission to begin excavating. Found the largest tells in the area. Thought that's the largest one. And it spent 15 years or so excavating down through the layers. And we went through the, the, the 1000 BC layer. That's why I've showed you this before. He picked this up right here. One of the guys that was excavating picked this up. And this, this comes from that site right there. It's a jar handle from about 1000 BC. And then that they would have had to just keep excavating down. So anyway, these guys are going to, well, turn the page. Sodom and Gomorrah now is going to come down to the Dead Sea. I'm on page two. And now I've got a circle there at where that we're at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Uh, it says tar pits and it says the battle. So then you see the from from Sodom, Gomorrah, Ad, Adma, Zeboim, the little dotted line coming down there with an arrow meeting at the X of the four kings coming off of uh, the west side of the Dead Sea. And they meet there for the battle where uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are defeated. All the kings are going to flee and run away, but they're going to lose the battle and then on their way by they're going to probably plunder the cities take all the possessions and all the people with them up north towards damascus now what's this have to do with abraham again i i don't want to be uh degrading or talking down to you or us but this is this is four kings coming against this whole land which may include some kind of giant nephilim type remains at least legends have that they're connected to it in their own in their own i believe the story is accurate but they may have had their own legends how they were connected to it all these cities have been destroyed all the way down to gulf of Aquaba. they've come back up and now they're going to meet sodom which is like the the crowning city most prosperous city in the area they're going to meet them defeat them plunder them and take them north to damascus and that's where Little old Abraham with his wife Sarah, who's just wandering around on a camel, finds about his nephew being taken captive. He goes, oh, that boy, he never made good decisions. And it's like, see, so the point of the story is don't make bad decisions, don't live in Sodom. But that's not how the story goes. <laughs> it, it, it's flat out, I mean, it's flat out amazing if you read it for what it says. Okay, so here we go. You can follow those maps uh, that's what I'm going to read now, what those maps show you. Chapter 14, verse 5. In the 14th year, Ketelamer, after they didn't pay taxes in the 13th year, Ketelamer says, okay, I will come and get it. So Ketelamer and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Raphaites in Ashtaroth, Kadim. And again, you can look that up. What does that mean? It, it, to us, it's just a hard word to pronounce when you're reading the scriptures publicly. This is just, uh, just a bunch of places with a bunch of hard words. The Raphaites, the Kerizites, da, 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 and the Termites, ha, 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 and we move on. It's like, wait, 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 let's go back and what, what did they think? This means something in the context, and each of these has a historical setting. You can draw references from the scriptures, from the Ugaritic text, the Mesopotamian text, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jewish literature. We can identify, and, and we did a little bit. We're not going to spend the rest of the day identifying those. But don't, I mean, you can as we read through this, but realize each of these should be identified. What do you, because it means something. It just said, just defeated a bunch of people. It's like it names the, the cities, the location, and those locations are important, and I don't have time to get into it uh, because I'm still kind of researching it, but it does have to do with <laughs> dead spirits, spirits that have died and gone to the underworld, and they're constantly trying to make contact with these spirits. It's, it's Canaanite religion. It's, it's Baal, like we talked before. Baal dying, going to the other world, and being brought back up for bringing spring. Part of it's the agricultural cycle, but it's still the idea that there is authority in the underworld because these were the original rebels that had been, like Peter and Jude talk about, were locked up. But if they can somehow make contact with them and get some kind of authority, they have feast form vessels trying to get some kind of power to rule in this earth. Uh, we talk about Mount Hermon. That's where, that's where the gates of Hades were. And that's where they would go and they'd have sacrifices. They'd try to reach into the gates of Hades, into the underworld, to get blessings and direction. All of that has to do with these places. They're, they're key places of Canaanite religion which matches Mesopotamian, Ugaritic, Egyptian, eventually Greece and Rome at some level. Anyway, they went out and defeated the Rephaites in Ashtaroth, Carnium, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shava, Kiriathium, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir. 
So it starts here in Bashan, and by the time you get to the hill country of Seir, you've gone all the way through here, and the hill country of Seir is here in Edom, and they're on their way down here to the Gulf of Aquaba. That, that's, they just defeated all, they went right down the King's Highway. They're just conquering the King's Highway, uh, the caravan route. Uh, then they turned back and went to En Mushfat, that is Kadesh. So it might have been called something different in Abraham's day, but when Moses is editing it, he may have been the one who added Kadesh because it's Kadesh Barnea, and that's where they're going to end up going. That would be in the Negev, south in the Negev. And they conquered the whole territory, the Amalekites. Remember, the Amalekites were down south in, in the Negev in, in the book of Deuteronomy, or excuse me, book of Numbers, but also in David's lifetime, as well as the Amorites who were living in Hazazon Tamar. Now, where's Hazazon Tamar? It's right here. So they've got, I mean, it tells you all, it's like the point of that little couple verses is it was incredible. They just marched through the land from the land of Bashan, down through Edom, down to the Gulf of Quaba, back up through the Negev, all the way up to south of Salem. Why did they take Salem while they're there? Why, why didn't they take Salem? I mean, Salem's right there. They go up and we're done. Why? I, I mean, it doesn't tell you why. But a fair suggestion is there's a guy who's the king here. His name is Melchizedek, and he is a, high, a priest and king, but he's a priest of God Most High, so he's worshiping the same God that Abraham is worshiping, not these pagan deities. He's worshiping the same God and living in his territory, using his fields in exchange for protection is a guy named Abram who was a sheik, apparently, coming out of Mesopotamia, out of Ur, who went and spent some time in Haran and got rich, after being rich, came down into the land with all of his people and flocks and herds, had a famine, says, well, I can't go back on where God called me. I'm going to have to go to Egypt. And in Egypt, got crazy rich, if you remember the story, and now comes back, and now his nephew's even as rich. His, they have to split, so he stays here. So he's using the pasture, but he's a power player. Uh, the Pharaoh knows him. They know him in Haran. They know him in Ur. Do you think these four kings have heard of Abram? Probably not. He's an old man walking around with a camel, leading his wife around looking for a place to put his tent. It's like, okay, if you're in Sunday school, but if you're in history, he's left Ur to Haran, here down to Egypt, and now come back, and he's now got a treaty with Melchizedek. You'll see the treaty that he will protect Melchizedek if he can use the land, and they get right here. Now, I I'm not saying this is for sure. I'm just saying they got right here, and we're done. Why? Why don't you, I, I, you go down here, turn around, come here, just keep right on going. You can go, you can go up to Haran going this way, because they're going to go up to Damascus. You can go up this way, as well as you can go this way, unless they want to turn around and plunder Sodom, which may be the reason. But nonetheless, they still stopped here and didn't get one more place. Salem. They leave Salem alone. Again, I don't know. I'm just, that's just what the Bible says, and I know Abram's there. Well, you'll see. Uh, who were, were living in, in Hazon Tamar, so they stop here. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of, king of Bela, that is, Zoar, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Siddim against Ketelamur. Now, do you hear what I just said right there? With the Bible? These, wherever these guys are at, you can put them anywhere on the universe you want to but at that point they get their troops together and they march their force out and drew their battle lines up right here so there the battle is going to take place right here where this place is at is not identified in that verse it's just wherever they were they got together got their troops together and went out and their battle lines are right here to cut these guys off from coming back down the king's highway they think they're going to get them in this dry place they're going to be ready for them and take them down right here apparently so i think it matches that they went out here and met him. And you don't have to accept that. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to accept that, just like I don't have to accept that Sodom's down here. On, you know. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's false teaching. I'm saying I think we've got a better presentation. And I'm willing to change my mind with more information because we want the truth, not just you know, what I think. Okay, then the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Siddim against Ketelaver, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Sinar, and Ariot, king of Eleazar. Four kings against five. 
Now, the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits. So, the valley of Siddim is not the Kakar, the fertile plain where the water's at. Because it's full of tar pits. It's two different identifications. It was full of tar pits. When the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, didn't even tell how the battle went. It says it's full of tar pits. They come back. Here's the battle. And the kings of Sodom, they all start running. Some of the men fell into them, the tar pits, and the rest fled to the hills, leaving their cities totally defenseless. Uh, that, that is the way a military will behave in the fourth generation. The, the, the kings are going to run away to flee to other countries for protection because they'll have some kind of agreement somewhere. Any kind of the troops will flee to the hills and forsake any responsibility because it's like they're not, gonna, they're not willing, they don't have the capacity to fight. That's why they're under the fourth cycle of discipline, or we'd say the fifth cycle of discipline at the end of the fourth generation. Although I shouldn't say that because they're, gonna, they're in the fourth generation here, but the fifth final cycle of discipline is going to come at the end of the fourth generation, which is going to be that solar blast that blows all the salt water up and just eliminates this location. That's the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's coming later. So this is typical fourth generation behavior, but we're not seeing the destruction of the culture yet, just the oppression of the culture. Um, okay, verse 11. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and they went away. So they win the battle. The kings flee. Some of the men fall in the tar pits, run to the hills, and they just get right, the kings of the four kings get right back on the highway and head right back north, and as they go by Sodom, they plunder it. It, it says it right here. They took everything. And Sodom is not here. I mean, it, it can't be there. It just, it, geographically doesn't make sense. They had to go where Sodom was. Uh, and they, all their food, and they went away. They also carried off, here's the pivot, also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. Not near Sodom, in Sodom. And now, it's kind of like, just play this out for me. Think of, you know, gang warfare or something like this, and you know you're not going to mess with Abram. But then on your journey north, someone says, hey, I think you took Abram's nephew. It's like, what? We got Abram's nephew. Who, where's he at? It's like, you guys took him. It's like, oh no. It's like, you know, you'd make a great movie. It's like, they're going to avoid, we don't want any trouble with Abram. But then they end up taking his nephew and taking, it's like, you took who? You took Lot? Do you know who he, he's, he's, he's Abram's nephew. You could just, I mean, you could just hear the movie becoming very dramatic, a turning point in the movie. And it is a turning point right here. So, one who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Once again, a clear clue. Someone down here from this battle escapes, running to the hills. He escapes a guy. There's nowhere to go. His kings are all scattered. The military is defeated. Their cities have been plundered. It's like, where do we turn? I'm going to Abram. So he runs from here up and finds Abram, wherever Abram's at in this area, and tells him, not you need to help us. He's got one bit of information. Uh, they took Lot. That's all I'll need to say. They got Lot. Now, as a father figure, uh, Abram may have an attitude like me. Well, stupid Lot. He should have known better. You don't, don't make treaties with these people. Don't live in the city. You guys are under the fourth cycle of discipline. Lot got, gets what he deserved. Except... There's probably a covenant between Abram and his nephew Lot. There's probably some kind of an agreement, a signed contract, if you would. The Bible doesn't explain that, but Abraham's certainly behaving like that. He doesn't say, well, this stupid kid, so what's, what's going to happen? It's like you act stupid, you live stupid, you get stupid. He goes, well, we're going to war, guys. Why? Why, Why would you do this, Abram? You've got four kings just defeated the entire land, and you're like, well, I signed a contract. I got an agreement. He's not doing this out of love. He's not doing it, okay, love. Okay, let's stop. Love in the English language means emotion, connection. I feel for this person. Love, a uh, Hasid in the Old Testament is covenant love. So when I said love, we're, we're okay, be careful because he's not going there because, well, you know, I really like, like a lot. I respect him. I, you know, I owe it to him. Well, okay, and I, I'm not even saying this right because he does owe it to me. He signed a contract with him. 
He's not doing it because of his emotional connection a lot. He's doing it because of his love of a covenant, his covenant love. That explains a lot of verses and helps you get out of this stupid postmodern thinking where God loved Israel. It, it, well, you know, it does talk about that being his heart and his, you know, the apple of his eye, different things like this. But he makes the Abrahamic covenant with Israel. So that means I am going to do this no matter what you do. I'm going to do this for Abraham's seed. Now, when they act wickedly, he'll punish them, but he'll always bring them back because he loves them. What do you mean he loves them? How can you love this group of people that's in rebellion? No, no, I don't love them. I have a covenant of love. I have a, co- I have a marriage contract with them. I have a hasid. I, I, I'm ob- obligated to bring them back. I promised Abraham. So it's a whole different dimension. You can throw that into the love of Christ. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Christ is in heaven just like, you know, he's got that big red heart. Just, oh, I just love these people. Okay. Or through his covenant, the new covenant, he's got a covenant that he has poured out his blood. You are in the covenant. You're a child of God. He has signed the covenant with his own blood. You are in my protection. You are mine. And and nothing can separate you from it. Not death or life or angels or demons or trouble or future. You can't be separated because I made a covenant. And he's God. And there's nothing high. When God says, I make a covenant, yeah, but what if there's something that breaks the you can't break God's covenant. He's going, it's his word. It's his covenant. So when you think about the love of Christ, you, you, you don't need to be emotional as much as you need to be confident that it is a secured contract, a covenant in Christ's blood that he wanted to sign, and no one's going to break it. Not even you. You're, you're his. And he will take care. He'll take you from point A to point B or Z. He'll get you to the place he wants you to go. Again, There'll be ups and downs and, and valleys and things. And that's kind of what we've got here, I believe, is a contract, a covenant. Well, let's see. Uh, verse 13. One that had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now, this is the first time this is used in the Bible, the word Hebrew. So it's like, what does this mean? It, it may come back to, go back to one of Tares, the, the ancestors, Eber. Eber, you know, it goes through, goes through all the generations. Eber, it may come from there. They're not sure. It ends up becoming a, a, a word that refers to shepherds, the pastor shepherds, and they try to figure out how it gets out of, out of, a, out of Egypt. But nonetheless, it, there's the first reference to Hebrew, which may be nothing more at this point than he is a descendant of Eber through Terah, which is connected to Shem, who got off the ark, because Eber would be in there. He's one of those descendants. That's just a thought. Uh, some want to say that it, it's connected to Hebron, the city, that, that's where Abram's going to be involved with Hebron. Just keep that in mind. I, I can't give you a definite on that and a lot of ideas about that. But there's the word Hebrew. Now, Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all whom were allied with Abram. So he's living near the trees of Mamre, and I've got that on the map. You can see the trees of Mamre. It's, it's near Hebron, okay? So there's a place down here. In near Hebron, the trees of Mamre, and he's allied with these guys. So he's got contracts with, uh, now the tree, I'm going to read this again. Now, a- Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, which is Hebron, the Amorite, so that he owns that land. Mamre owns the land near Hebron, and he was a brother of Eshgol and Aner. So those are three brothers who were in some kind of a position probably similar to Abram, that they've got either they were the king of Hebron and his brothers, and Abram was using the territory around Hebron and was under protection with them, or they were also shepherds or sheiks or whatever Abraham is, and they had a contract with each other. Nonetheless, when Abram's nephew is taken, it would appear that Abram's under contract to go deliver him. But he's also living near Hebron, and he's got a contract, a covenant, with these three people, which would mean they would assume they are believers. There's, there, if Abram's going to be signing contracts, it would appear there's going to have to be an equal basis of religion. That's why he's gonna, you're going to see him talking to Melchizedek on a covenant basis, but he tells the king of Bera, I don't even want a shoestring from you. I don't even want, I want, I want no connection, I want no connection with you whatsoever. He said, I've, I've raised my hand to God most high, and I've made a covenant that I will not sign anything with you. 
In other words, if I'm going to sign a contract with somebody, I've already sworn allegiance to the God Most High. Anybody he's coming into contracts with are going to have to have the same agreement that we've got the same God. I'm not going to sign a contract with Bera, and he, he basically mocks him, and we will see that coming up. He wasn't very nice. Um, but he was truthful. Verse 14, when Abram heard that his relative, I think that maybe, and again, be careful when I'm, you know, where I'm speculating. It doesn't say he had a contract with him, but relative, he's part of his family. You'd think he does. Had been taken captive, he called out 318 shepherds. No. 318, you know, servants that took care of Sarah and his donkey. It's like, no, 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, it doesn't mean he, that's not everybody. He doesn't take, called out everybody in his camp, let's go to war. I'll need the three, I need the militia. The shepherds go to work. Those that are taking care of Sarah and her tent, they take, everybody else just keep doing what you're doing. Militia, let's go. And they mount up probably on horses and go. And they went as far as Dan, which is Dan is right about here. And the kings were on their way to Damascus to go back to, their, to the east. He catches up to them at Dan. Notice how he didn't have to train them. You guys, uh, sharpen your swords. He doesn't even tell them to sharpen their swords. He just calls them, let's go. Giving the impression, understand, the whole time, every time you see Abram go to Haran or come and make an altar at Bethel or go to Egypt or come back and travel in the Negev or whatever, it's like these 308, where, where do these guys come from? Oh, they've been there the whole time. You don't just wander from country to country just on a camel. It's like when he shows up at the border, it's like, uh-oh. And it's like he wants to go in and meet with Pharaoh. And so I guess he's going to go meet with the Pharaoh. He wants to go meet with, because it's like here's his cattle, here's his riches, and here's his entourage. Not just an entourage, here's his bodyguard, here's his militia. I mean, it changes your image of Abraham from being an old man with an old woman and a camel to being holy smokes. It's like, I, I'm not making it up right here. What, it, it's, it's, listen, when Galen heard that his son had been taken by the gangs in Chicago, he called the police. He called 911. <laughs> when Abram heard that his relative had been taken, he called out the 318 trained men, in his, trained men from, born in his own household. I just went over and knocked on the door of the, uh, you guys, it's time to go to war. And 318, mean, they're, out, they're armed and ready to go. It's like, oh, well, that ain't 911. 911? Who needs 911? I got 911, and they're right here in my own camp. Do you understand the, the, the difference? Now, you can read it yourself, but I may, I may be overplaying it, but well, you can watch what happens. I don't think I'm e maybe not even explaining it well enough. He went as, it, they went in pursuit as far as Dan. So he leaves everybody behind apparently gets on horses and you want to throw in camels during the night abram divided his men to attack them and routed them so he divides them into like they're, they're camped up by dan these four kings with all the plunder from all of these cities and all the captives because he's going to bring the people back they didn't kill everybody they took them all as slaves they're going to sell them they're going to use them whatever they're all up here and, and they're no one's going to they've already defeated everybody uh, they didn't mess with this guy though they left Abram alone. But they did mess with him unknowingly. So one night, they, 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 he, if he divides in two or three groups, it's, a, it's the first recorded night attack in history. When you go through all the battle documents of the ancient Mesopotamian Egyptian text, this is the first night attack in history. It says, he, during the night, Abram divided his men. So now he's directing. He's not just saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. He's leading the charge. He's giving directions to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, which is 100 miles north from Damascus. So from there, he pursues them for about 100 miles from Dan. It's like on the run. They're scattering, they're dropping, they're splitting off, they're running to the hills, and they didn't take all their stuff with them. He goes back, well, he goes right, all, as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. So he chased them from Dan, he chased them north of Damascus. Let's see if I've got a map here. Yeah, the next map on page two. There's Hobah. North of we go like 100 miles from there. They go 100 miles from Hobah. They were already north of Damascus. They go a total of 100 miles north of Damascus before he stops pursuing him. Comes back to their camp, which is near Dan. Um, 
Um, I've lost my place here. Okay, re- okay. D- as far as Hobah, so Hobah would be 100 miles north of Damascus. So if we look at this again, Dan is just north of the Dead, Dead, Dead Sea, or uh, Sea of Galilee, and we've been to Dan before. It's very green, a lot of water. The water coming right out of Mount Hermon down on Dan, just full of water. It feeds into the Sea of Galilee. It's where the Jordan River begins, the waters of Dan. It feeds into the Sea of Galilee, overflows, and forms the Jordan River. So they are at Dan. Abraham pursued them to Hobar, which is 100 miles north of Damascus. Or a total of 100 miles. He recovered, watch this, he recovered all the goods and brought back his relative lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. So he, ca- he, he, he chases those four kings in their military are gone. Leaving behind all the captives, all the possessions, Lot and his possessions, and he brings back Lot, Lot's possessions, all the people's possessions, and all the people are brought back down this way, back down into his territory. Not back home, but back down to who he's got a treaty with. He brings them back. Why is he bring him to why is he bring him to Salem? Why is he bring him to Melchizedek? What, what, what is this? Now he's got Eshcol, Anner, and Mamre that have joined with him. So Abram goes out with his men. These other three guys go out, and they're probably not just alone. They probably got their own military. So we're not sure how many people go up there, but they scatter those four kings and they bring everything back. Now, it's night. They've won the battle. All this, these four kings, are they, all, are they all drunk? Are the soldiers all disarrayed, disarmed? You know, I mean, it was, this, you know, I'm saying it. They may not have been ready for, they didn't draw up their battle lines like down here. They were up here camping. It may have been late at night, drunk, weapons don't know where their weapons are. It was clearly a night attack, a surprise attack. And so they probably weren't ready. So, you know, but yet he still did it. Well, it was a surprise attack. They weren't expecting it. Okay, well, you try that. You go out and surprise a gang somewhere in downtown Chicago and just surprise them and see how it goes for you. Yeah, they weren't ready for me. Ah, boo. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, surprise had an element, but it's not the whole thing. You can surprise uh, a gang member or a gang and, and it's not going to, it's just going to tick them off. Uh, I've never tried these things myself, so <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm talking not from experience. He recovered, okay. Verse 17, after Abram returned from defeating Ketelamer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom, Bera, came out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, that's the word Yahweh, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you. I don't think that was a thing he swore that afternoon. I think that was a thing he swore several years before me i'll never be in a contract with you not even a thread of or a thong of a sandal that means like a a shoestring or a piece of leather from your sandal so that you will never be able to say i made abram rich you will never be able to say i have abram under contract i gave abram a sandal so abram and i if i need to i can call on abram he said i made sure that you've given me nothing you'll never be able to point to any situation any object and say you have a covenant, or I have a covenant obligation to you. You and I have no obligation, and it's not starting today. Even a thread or a thong of sandals so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. When he says, I made, that's not just a boast. Oh, I'm the one who made Abram rich. It was because I went to business. I made Abram rich. I gave him something, so now he owes me. That, that's, that's contract, that's covenant terminology. I made him rich, so Abram, it's time for you to pay back what I did for you. He says, you've never done something for me, and I'll never let you do something for me. I will, I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. Anner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them have their share. Now, what happens right there in that, at the end, he says, okay, we'll have to admit my men did eat some of the plunder. We ate some of the food on the way back, and we'll like just accept that as, you know, mileage. The men are going to, what they ate, they're going to get to keep. And I don't want anything, but I cannot speak for Mamre, Anner, and Eskel. 
you guys, you get your share if you want it, but I don't want my share. Take it all. So we don't know what Eshkel, Anna, and Mamre did. They may have followed suit and says, keep it all. Because they did go back and they, they, they rebuilt quickly. They, I mean, they're, they're going to be up and running fairly quickly at, in time to bit, get destroyed by the solar or the, the atmospheric blast. Um, but yeah, go back here, and what we have, go back to verse uh, 17. After Abram returned from defeating Ketelamer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shava. Now, if you turn the page, the, that is the king's valley. If you turn the page, did I put pictures on this? Oh, yes, there it is, page three. Uh, you can see this, uh, the first map is Abram coming down, back down towards Salem. He's, he's coming back, apparently, through the hill country. Uh, he, he would have gone through Samaria and comes out in the valley of Shava, which is the Kidron Valley. It's what's east of Jerusalem. Uh, and there's some pictures of that. I'll try to explain it. You can still see it. And it is a... Okay, how are we going to do this? Here's the Kidron Valley. Here's the Hinnom Valley running over here, joining this, and it runs down towards the Dead Sea. Here, right here, is a, a ridge that runs like this. This is the Gion Springs right here. Uh, that's well watered. The city of Salem is located right here on this ridge. And this is a deep valley. This is the Mount of Olives over here. This would be the city of Salem. It was eventually conquered by David. But the king right here is Melchizedek at this time. Uh, for some reason, now here's the Jordan River way over here. You've got to go through the wilderness of Judea to get to the Jordan. Then over there is Sodom. The king of Sodom is right here. I mean, his people have been gone up there. He's been defeated. And meanwhile, he's over here. Why? Why is he here? Abraham's here. He knows where Abraham's going. Uh, he's following Abraham. He's got nothing left. So the king of Sodom is here, and Abram's kind of like, uh, he's, he, I think he doesn't have much respect for him. Melchizedek comes out at the same time, comes out here and meets Abram in this valley right here. So he's got two kings. He would have brought back all the people, somewhere, they're, they're somewhere in here. The city of Jerusalem then is going to expand up. When David takes the city, they're going to expand up in this area. Uh, the Mount Moriah is up here. That's going to be built up where Solomon's going to build the temple. Then walls are going to be built around this like this. The palace will be here. This will be the city of, uh, uh, of Jerusalem in, say, uh, Hezekiah's day until 700 when the Assyrians invade. Then they're gonna have, people are going to start camping over here. I'm going to bring this. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. There's another valley, the central valley right here. They're going to start building on this western hill, a bunch of the refugees coming out of Israel, and they're going to expand the city like this. You can see your, on your maps in your Bible. And then by the time Jesus' day comes, they're going to build up here like this. And this will be the city. Then after about 45 A.D., it's going to go further north and come around, and this whole city will be like this. And that's kind of the city of Jerusalem today. We'll have to cut this off like this. Today, the city of Jerusalem is right here with this original city outside the walls of the city. That's why the architect, when you go into here right here, the Joppa Gate today, there's two 1,500 tombs, aged from 1,500 A.D., tombs right there of the architects. Once they built this for Solomon the Magnificent, he came down to visit it, and they didn't include the city of David and Mount Zion right here. Now that's what they call the Mount, Mount Zion. This is actually Mount Zion biblically, but this, was, this western hill is called Mount Zion today. They didn't include this because the people here wouldn't pay their share of the taxes, so the architects, forget it. We're not putting the wall around you. Well, when Solomon the Great came down, he says, why didn't you include this? He says, they wouldn't pay the money. He says, he honored them for doing a great job and then cut their heads off for not obeying directions. And their tombs, or you can see their tombs right there. It's in my Jerusalem book. You can see the pictures. Their tombs are right there where they look like they got their heads cut off because they didn't include this part of the city. Nonetheless, we'll have to pick this up next week, but we've got Abram meeting here in the, the, in the valley uh, of Kidron, and you've got the pictures right there. If you're looking, if you are standing, this first picture, if, if you're standing right here, and this is the corner of the temple wall right here. It may have been where Jesus was tempted to jump. We don't know. One of the highest places maybe over here. But if you're standing right here in this valley, like I was when I took that picture, I was standing right here, looking up from the bottom of the valley, up at this corner of the, the it would be the southeast corner of the Temple Mount. That's that first picture. I'm standing right here at the floor of the Kidron, looking up. This view right here is I'm standing right up here, looking down the Kidron Valley. You can see the valley going down. This picture I took right here, I'm standing out here. And I'm looking this way. 
So you can see right here, Mount Moriah is right here. That's the temple. That's where the Dome of the Rock is standing today. Then the Kidron Valley, I've got that marked. Then the Mount of Olives rises over here. And right there where the Kidron Valley, that little arrow is, that's right here where the city of Salem is. So right about where the Kidron Valley is pointing at right there, that would be about where this story is taking place um, when they meet there. And of course, it's around 1900 B.C. I've got to quit. We'll pick this up. We're going to have the meeting right here in the Kidron Valley with Abram. Uh, just interesting. Just, I mean, it's like, what's this mean? I don't know. It's, it's cool. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, and it all kind of adds, brings it all together. I'll pray, and you're free to go. Father, we do thank you for the chance to look into these things. We thank you for your word. We thank you for recording these things historically for us that we may understand who these people were and have a better understanding of how you interact in their lives. And we do ask that we'd apply these things to our lives, that we'd have the faith that Abraham had, the confidence that you are unchanging in the things you promised you were going to do, that we may, again, be able to walk in faith, not knowing all the answers, but understanding the things you promised are true and will come to pass as we continue to walk faithfully in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.